another edition of the Trauma Informed Care Task Force. Excited to be with you all on this more temperate Thursday. Um, thank goodness for the weather, hopefully getting cooler. Um, really excited to be here. I'm Zeke, uh, co-chair of the task force with my good friend and colleague, Tisha Edwards. And one thing I wanted to say, which I always say is this meeting is being recorded as you've now seen. Um, so um, just a heads up on that. Um, only announcement from me before passing over to Tisha and then getting us started. Um, there was a really nice piece that Scripps did. Uh, Scripps is like a national news thing that then syndicates in 60 different regions. Um, ours is like the WMAR. Um, but anyway, they did a really nice piece focused on trauma-informed care task force member Erica Bridgeford, as well as some of the work that we've been doing through the Healing City Act in our library spaces, which I'm going to put in the chat. This is the California version of it, um, but it was in 60 places and it's a really nice piece. So if you get a chance at some point, um, check it out. Um, with that, going to pass it right over to Tisha. Hello, Councilman Cohen and everybody on our amazing task force. It's good to see everyone. Happy to be here. And it is a perfect day in Baltimore. This is like my favorite Baltimore weather day. This is what I want it to be like every day. So I'm really happy. Spirits are up because I got a perfect uh, weather day. Uh, and uh, I think our next thing that we're going to do is round the horn. Is that right? And okay, so is it it's and we're going to do it in small groups, right? Are you ready to do the Wizard of Oz thing? And okay, great. So Anne is going to move us into our small groups. And I'm just trying to make sure Anne, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't do it yet. Don't do it yet. Yes, uh, our small group question of the day is as you look to the fall, what are ways you hope to find or contribute to healing in your community? What are you looking forward to? We are closing the door on summer. We are looking forward to fall. I will begin wearing turtlenecks on Monday. And so as we move into the fall, what are ways we hope or you hope to find or contribute to healing? How are you gonna to contribute to healing in our community? Um, what are you looking forward to? All right, and I, that's the, the call of the day and we are ready to go into our groups, everybody. Hi, Chris. Hi, Hi Debbie. Hello. Um, Phil, I have you in a group, but I don't think I, Chris and Debbie, you're going to stay here. So you're not supposed to be vanishing to anywhere. Okay. Well, I'm, um, drive, I'm driving, so I can't do anything to oh. move myself into a group. If Then I'm going to leave you here. I, you're fine. I just, and Debbie, I, I just walked out of the police commissioner's office with a meeting that ran a half hour longer than I was supposed to. You're totally fine, Phil. So I am going to assign Debbie to go join Jasmine who is just, you're kicking me out? I am, if I can figure out how, so. What, is there, is there like a mission on these meet in what we're doing? So what minute. you're going to do is you were answering a question that is just, as we look to the fall, what is one way that you hope to contribute to healing in the community or to, to turn to the community for healing? So it could be either one. Okay. All right. So yeah. Chris and Phil, that's what we're going to answer here is as we look to the fall, what are we hoping to contribute or what are we hoping to find in community? What are you looking forward to? So Phil, can you go first for us? So I'm hoping for some of the community activities and discussions that have been taking up into uh, over the summer to sort of the more 
most um, to morph into a next step, which be you know where the community people are actually involved um, with, with uh, implementing some of the activities that people have been talking about. Nice, wonderful. I'm also hopeful for that. All right, Chris. Yeah, I would echo definitely. Um, you know, hopeful that that some of the the committee work and all will will blossom and and uh, bear fruit. Um, beyond that, and, and very related, uh, some of the work that we're doing at University of Maryland and how we first connected with you guys. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that this fall we're going to be able to bring some of that, and when we're trying to really um, gather every every resource, every service that's sort of in our catchment area and start making um, it a lot easier to figure out where to go and who to see and and, and what is offered. Um, and we're really hoping that will help um, the community at least know a bit more about what's available um, and be able to access a bit more. Great. Um, I'll go next and then I'll have Tamar share. Um, I am, my background's in teaching and when I joined Zeke's team, I had a one-year-old. And so I was kind of just focused on this, but my, it's now been a few years and I get to support a Girl Scout troop this fall. Mm. And I haven't done any of that, like work with kids on a close, consistent basis like that for a long time. And I'm really excited to have that in my life. Like they think I'm doing it for them, but I'm doing it for me. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, Tamar, we're just sharing one thing we're looking forward to okay. in contributing in, to healing and community or for ourselves. Great. I'm um, sorry to be late, by the way. I hope I'm not in the wrong place. You're great. <laughs> nope, you're great. Um, okay, let's see. So I'm sharing my, uh, I'm sorry. Say <laughs> no, you're fine. You're sharing, as you look to the fall, what are ways you hope to find or contribute to healing in your community? What are you looking forward to? Yeah. Um, well, I just had a conversation with folks at City Schools today, and um, I guess I'm really hoping to learn more about what's currently happening in City Schools and what their mission is and feel like I can align what I'm doing a little bit more with what they're doing <laughs> so that um, it can be directly helpful to students. Wonderful, wonderful. Who did you meet with? I met with Sarah Warren and, and a couple of the folks on her team. Great. Yeah, I'll check my mic. Is my mic working at all? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a little crackly is the only problem. You're super quiet. Okay. I think we're all back. All right. Welcome back. Um, oh, and I do, I should have done this at the beginning. Um, shame on me and Tisha, but just want to give a big, big, big shout out to all the educators and students on the task force um, we love you. We appreciate you. Thank you, Teresa and Fariha and Daniel and um, as well as, of course, our college level, level friends, Kevin Daniels. Um, shout out to Young Elder. Uh, first week at Coppin, I think, um, this week. So again, appreciate, appreciate, appreciate Dr. Leaf. Um, Tamar, everybody, Dr. K. Dr. K, yeah, Kyla, um, you know, it, look, I, hardest and most challenging but rewarding job I've ever had was being a teacher. And so just want to say thank you for, um, for, for doing it and, um, you know, excited despite the weirdness of coming back with like still the trepidation of Delta and everything else and knowing how challenging that's going to be. Um, just excited for this school year. And so thank you all for what you do. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Fariha 
to introduce our DEI stuff. We're, we're going to, it's actually Kevin Daniels. Just kidding. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Daniels to intro to the, do the introduce yourself piece. Dr. Daniels. I'm going to, uh, hey family, uh, Kevin Daniels. Um, I hail just about, about three minutes I have. Um, I hail from Baltimore city. I've been here all my life. Um, and um, if, if I would theme um, what I'm getting ready to talk to you about uh, my life, my story rather, it would be under four categories, which is of course, um, challenge, um, community, uh, new chapter in my life and also celebration. Um, I was theming around those four things um, because I did grow up uh, in Baltimore City at that time. All of you are too young to remember uh, Murphy Homes. <laughs> um, I grew up in uh, Murphy Homes, which is, of course, uh, um, George Street and Myrtle Avenue. Um, and I remember when they uh, knocked that down, me and my, all of my family, all of my brothers, I have six brothers. Um, and I remember that. Uh, but then we moved to um, um, Division Street, which is in Upton um, and that Sandtown area, um, um, right across the street. I always uh, love to talk about that, right across the street from uh, Thurgood Marshall's um, a Legacy House, um, right there on Division Street. So um, again, um, and, and that whole area became um, our stomping ground, which is of course, uh, Upton, Sandtown, Druid Heights, um, Penn North, um, you can't just live in one community and not know about those communities as well. So I am a West Baltimore baby. Um, and then I moved over to East Baltimore. Um, I went to some of the best schools, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, in Baltimore City, Utah Marshburn, School 11, um, Booker T. Washington um, is when I went. Um, and, and, and the reason that I say um, um, community um, has been um, fantastic. Um, for me is because I remember places early on in my life, like the YMCA, um, Crispus Attics. Um, um, you gotta have your Baltimore card to remember this. I remember things, um, programs like BNBL basketball, uh, Project Survival, uh, Raleigh Hawkins Karate. Um, I, I went to the mosque on Wilson Street. Um, then I went to Trinity Baptist Church, Arena Players. Um, I remember things like the Operation Champ, and that's the reason why that's a theme for me, um, because um, because it was um, we didn't have much. Um, you know, I remember us growing up in the in kind of shallow area, an apartment, um, but we had community, um, and that was simply phenomenal. That's why I'm such a community activist at this point. Um, and it was it was early on. It was challenging for me. Uh, let me just say because. Um, the doctor had diagnosed me with a learning disorder and said that I would never be able, I would always be special ed, um, so that I would never be able to um, learn at the same rate or pace um, that my counterparts would learn. Um, well, if you know about um, the um, Black tradition, my grandmother wasn't going to have it that way. Um, and I'll never forget um, St. Martin. I went to Trinity Baptist, but then I went up to St. Martin Church. And my grandmother decided, got her girls together, um, the old elders, um, and they decided to lay hands on me. Um, and they laid hands on me and said um, that whatever, the, I was a kid, and they said, this is not going to be. Now you call it whatever you want. Um, and I'm a strong scientist, um, but you call it whatever you want. All I know is once they laid hands on me, um, I went back to the doctor and the doctor said, whatever that brain issue was, um, they said that it wasn't there any longer. Now, again, you call it chance, you call it luck, but in my tradition, my grandmother and them knew what they were doing um, and they laid hands on me. Um, and from that day on, I don't know what happened. I don't know whether they gave me superpowers, um, but um, somehow or another, um, um, I mean, that's what I called the early point as far as challenge, Some, somehow or another, I started to, I'll never forget at Booker T, I started to excel at an accelerated pace to the degree where um, my grades went all the way up um, and I started getting 95s and I went on to Baltimore Polytechnic um, Institute. Any of you city folk out there, you already know I have a problem with you. 
Um, but I started going to um, Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. Um, and from there, um, the NSA, National Security Agency, came and got me um, from um, Poly. And I worked for the National Security Agency as a science analyst um, and physicist um, for 10 years um, at the National Security Agency. And again, the reason why that was critical because I, I again, I, I surmounted whatever happened early on in my life, um, I surmounted those challenges and was able to operate and function um, in an accelerated way in the, uh, to the degree where um, at, after the National Security Agency, I wanted to be a social worker. So I decided to go back to Morgan State University, go Bears, um, and um, earn a MSW, went to the University of Maryland and earned two earned PhDs, um, one in public health and the other one in education. Um, I went to um, Johns Hopkins um, for a degree and also Harvard University um, as well. So somewhere, y'all say what you want about my grandmother. Um, she may not have finished high school, um, but she sure enough did something, um, something happened. Um, and here I am today. That's why I celebrate every elder. I celebrate everybody um, and community because all of those things are critical. Um, I became a social worker at Johns Hopkins Hospital in the um, in the homeless um, in the homeless um, area of the psychiatric uh, department. And it was there. I mean, I share this story all the time. I know I have about a minute or so left, but I share this story all the time. Um, what changed my life? These were the pivotal point was a learning disorder, but the second pivotal point was when I went to, when I went to, um, when I literally went to, um, I was out on the street looking for cl um, clients and, and navigating people under the, the Vodok, all of that. And I saw my father under the bridge. He was homeless. He was a giant in my life where my dress, my style, I got that all from him, but he was under a bridge. And he was one of my first clients because when I went to him, I'll never forget, um, I cried for three days. I did not know what happened to my dad, um, but he was underneath of that bridge. He was homeless and he, had, and he had injured his back, all of that. So again, I assisted in getting him into the hospital. Um, he had been paralyzed, um, but this is my first job. And this is where, and that was one of my first clients. Of course, I couldn't take him on um, because of you know, that family um, issue, but it also changed my clinical work um, to also start looking at community work. And that's what started my career. It, it was a chapter in my life that started my career um, early on to see my dad under there. I wanted to know what led to him going, because all I remember was a sharp black man Bethlehem Steel gave me my first hundred dollars to go to Morgan um, again, um, and yet this person was underneath of a bridge. And I have since then, of course, committed my whole life um, to um, to this urban work um, of we our us to build. Um, and the very church that my grandmother uh, laid her hands on me, I'm now pastoring that church um, in West Baltimore and working with Druid Heights. A Madison Park. I'm on the Midtown Board, um, but also, um, yes, sir, coming full circle. Um, and I'm the pastor there, and I'll do right where I grew up at. Um, and um, and again, um, we started the. I'm a part of the Healing City family. I'm a part of this family, uh, the Hut family, healing us together, um, where we go out and we. It's just a grass grassroots a model where we go out and do trauma work. Um, with men and um, and with women as well, um, and and I guess as I, I close mine, um, um, I, you know, let me say, I believe in Baltimore um, because Baltimore has believed in me. Um, I wouldn't have got to Morgan State University without the community selling snowballs and frozen cups. That's how I got. I know y'all too young to remember this, um, but frozen cups. And snowballs is what we sold in clean block campaigns in Baltimore City. That's how this African American man um, went to college. The people community came together, and we sold snowballs. And I had my first. Um, it was my first time um, in moving forward in in college. The community cared enough 
And I'm still at a, um, um, a phase in my life where I still care enough about the community that cares for me. Um, and it is critical that I take care of my community. Um, I'll leave you with an old African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, let's go together. Thank you so much. Please give a big, big, big round, virtual round of applause to our friend, Dr. Kevin Daniels, um, who, in addition to being among the most dapper men in all of Baltimore, um, is also just one of these people who manages to seamlessly glide into different spaces, like one of the rare people who's like, cool with the church community, cool with the academic community, cool with build, cool with healing, like, just manages to be all things and everybody respects him. Um, so if you ever get a chance in real life to meet this, this, this man, um, I, I highly suggest doing so. And again, appreciate having you on our task force and all that you do. Um, and with that, we'll pass it back to um, Tisha to, I think, give it over to our friends to do the DEI portion. Yes, and Dr. Daniels, I just want to say I am so inspired by your story. I was already a fan, but I'm a super fan now because you do look good every time I see you from head to toe. Hey, look, I'm going to send you some something for your cash app for giving me that compliment. <laughs> and, and you love people. So if you if you want me to be your agent, uh, for, you know, any type of modeling you want to do, you just let me know, Dr. Daniels, you, you do it with so much style and so much class. Um, and so it's not just what you wear on the outside, brother, it's also what you have on the inside. So thank you so much for, for, for sharing your story and helping me to get to know a little bit about you, um, today. All right, it is, yes, uh, Councilman Cohen, it is next time for us to go to our DEI presentation. And um, it's going to be, the topic is schooling as a form of oppression and trauma. And I always get this wrong, Fariha, yes, no. Thank you, Director Tisha. Yep, you got it right. Yeah. Um, I practiced today because yeah. oh, so thank you. And so Wonderful. I said, I want to try to get this right. So thank you so much. We are so excited about your DEI presentation. You are always the bomb.com. So I'm looking forward to you schooling us today. Thank you. And actually, my name is my identity. So I really appreciate you spent time learning it because I moved here actually from Pakistan in second grade. And all throughout my school life, I always had to reject my Pakistani identity to try to assimilate more and fit in more with other people. And that was definitely a form of oppression and trauma that I unlearned. So just hearing you say my name and practice it really validates and affirms me. But everybody, um, unfortunately, I came home to a power outage today and I don't have electricity or internet. So the wonderful Dan, who's also a teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools is going to be facilitating this portion and I look forward to um, hearing from him. He's gonna talk about oppression and um, trauma related to schooling. All right. Uh, hopefully this is working. We're going to try and bridge uh, the sound issue that we're having. Let me turn the sound off on this. It's apropos probably to the topic that we're going to be discussing. Mm. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback over here. Yeah, you're, you're coming in loud and clear, but then there's like a whole echo thing going on. Got it. Let me turn the computer volume off so I can get rid of that. Uh, Daniel, this is Monica. Monica. 
Okay, so hopefully I've been able to get rid of the echo. Um, I was not able to hear what Monica said, though, because I had to turn the speaker down. Is it possible uh, to put questions in the chat? Can I get any kind of uh, confirmation that... So I just unmuted on the phone and I'm on audio. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, apropos to the topic, I am speaking to you on a school laptop. It is actually a student laptop. It's the only one with a camera in my classroom. As you can see, that's where I am. Uh, and this, this is one of the challenges that, that goes directly in line with the topic that we're gonna be discussing today, because this is the exact computer that a student had to do virtual learning on last year. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my screen from the laptop so that you can at least see the PowerPoint. And uh, shout out to Faria. I'm, I'm sad that we all can't see the wonderful presentation uh, that she was gonna give. I know it would have been amazing. I'm gonna do my best to step into to those uh, amazing and, and difficult shoes to fill and uh, try to do justice uh, with a very, very important topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we wanna talk specifically about education as a form of oppression and a form of trauma as it exists in its current state, but we're gonna to touch a little bit on the history. Um, so just a, a reminder, since I'm in this weird situation where I'm talking on my phone to get the audio, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat so that I can see them come up and then uh, maybe uh, I'll, I'll do my best to address them as we're going along. Uh, but let's take a look at, at the image that we see on the board. This is a good starting place to think about the conditions that so many of our students face in Baltimore City. Um, we have a system that is very, very extremely heavy at the top, and it pours pressure down, creates intense amount of pressures at each level to where it lands almost exclusively on the shoulders of the, of the children in our schools. And it seems, and we constantly see this failing and breaking in so many different places, uh, that each individual from the highest level of power to the lowest is pressing down on the layer below them until someone quite often, uh, either a teacher or a student, makes a catastrophic mistake. We can see this in, in the news that just came out at schools like Augusta Fells, um, where, where professionals make choices to compromise even their own moral compasses because of demands that have been placed on them that are uh, absolutely irrational. And, and I want to, us to consider how this, this might be structural and this might be intentional that the purpose of education, our system of education, is less to educate and more to destroy the joy of learning. And this is an interesting uh, thing. So how do, we, how do we get there? So here, um, and, and I apologize for not having the world's fanciest PowerPoint right now. Uh, I kind of had to put it together a little bit quickly, but here's the, the points that I wanna at least touch on in our session today. And first, a little bit of, about me. Um, I am a teacher at Frederick Douglass High School in Baltimore City. This is my 10th year um, here teaching in the city, my ninth year at Douglass. Uh, I've taught every grade level in high school. Um, I spent five years as a ninth grade teacher, so I still consider myself a ninth grade teacher, even though now I teach 10th uh, grade uh, English and I teach uh, 11th grade AP language and composition. Um, so, I'm hoping that we'll be able to have time to get to each one of these topics, but uh, the, the key, I wanna, I wanna talk about the history of school seg segregation and the making of apartheid schools. I wanna talk specifically about black liberation schools and the way that the federal government essentially uh, shut down any effort by black communities to create their own independently led and run schools. Um, I wanna talk about the chronic underfunding that our schools face. I wanna talk about the deficit framework model that, that creates sort of built to fail systems that are self-perpetuating. And then finally, I wanna to touch on over-testing as, as an alienating force, um, one that, that enables the system to chronically fail because it's built that way, it's set up to do that work. Um, okay, uh, before we do this, let me tell a little story. It's August 10th, 1865, the man in the picture is Alexander Crummel. Alexander Crummel was the mentor uh, of W.E.B. Du Bois. He was um, an early black uh, Anglican bishop. He attended uh, the Noyes Academy, um, which was in New Hampshire. This is, as far as we know, the first co-ed um, 
and multiracial school in the country. Alexander Crummel was one of two black students that was, uh, that was attending this school. And when the, the local white population found out about it, they hitched a hundred oxen to the school building and they dragged the entire building in to a local swamp simply because Alexander Crummel and a friend of his had decided to attend the school and had an open invitation to do so. Uh, so, so this is, W.B. Du Bois talks about this, sto this story in The Souls of Black Folks. I think it's indicative. This was the first, as far as we know, the very first integrated school in America. Uh, and this was its fate. The problem, of course, is this is an ancient history. This is a process that we still see repeated today, even though its form has metamorphized. It looks very different, but the principle and outcomes are often the same. Okay, so let's, let's bring it into the future a little bit. Let's take a look at the current demographics of Baltimore City public, public schools, um, because what I'm talking about today could be applicable to other cities, but I think it's really important that we center it here on the experiences of our students here. We are a majority African-American district, 75.7% um, according to the numbers from last year. 14.2% um, are Hispanic and Latino, 7.5% uh, are white, 0.8% are Asian, 2% American Indian, 0.1% Pacific Islander, 58% of the students who attend our school are low income, um, and 9.6% are English language learners. Um, so, um, it wasn't an accident that Baltimore City Schools started to look like this. Um, Baltimore was a majority white school district with only, and someone correct me if I'm wrong on this, I believe two schools in the city serving the African-American population. One of them is Frederick Douglass High School, which not only served the city, but also served uh, black people in the, the surrounding area who would travel great distances to come to this school. This all begins to change in 1954 uh, with an, uh, a distinguished alumnus of this particular school, Thurgood Marshall, who successfully argued before the Supreme Court for uh, the case of Brown versus the Board of Education. And as everybody knows, he won. And so schools were ordered by the federal government to desegregate. One of the key problems with that is that uh, the justices at the time, all white, all male, uh, Thurgood Marshall had yet to join the Supreme Court. They concluded, they wrote a very problematic uh, order that said uh, schools needed to desegregate with all deliberate speed, with all deliberate speed, which is clearly an oxymoron because you can't both deliberate and do something with speed at the same time. And this gave a huge interpretive window for many school districts to drag their feet. And this is exactly what happened. In particular, uh, and I believe this was brought up in the chat, I saw it in, here in a second, white parents and white students became very, very vocal about refusing to desegregate their schools. Um, and we know across the country, this was a major issue. This took multiple decades. It was, it was a battle that was fought on uh, multiple front lines. Uh, but here's a picture from Baltimore City. You can see students protesting to keep city schools white. Uh, we want equal but segregation, which is an obvious contradiction in terms. So I want you to look at the, at the numbers, though, on the bottom. And I think this is crucial to understanding the situation that we're in and how we developed an apartheid schooling system here in the city. The numbers uh, that you're looking at are the census data for Baltimore County. And if you look close at the census data from Baltimore County, you look at the decades 1950 and 1960, you see that the population of Baltimore County almost doubles in that time. It goes from about 25.1% population growth in the 1940s to a 73.4% population growth in the decade of the 1950s. This isn't an accident. This is an intentional white flight of parents who are essentially creating a separate schooling system reinforcing segregation de facto and de jour over multiple decades. Now, you can see that this trend continues into the 1960s. And of course, those of you who know the history of Baltimore know that the riots in 1968 essentially sealed this deal. They also build 
um, into not just the city, but into the larger fabric of American history, a huge and, and very significant problem that that uh, feeds into the, the issue that we're talking about here. Uh, in, the, in the uprising and the riots that occurred in 68, after the, the assassination of Martin Luther King on April 4th here in Baltimore, uh, our sitting governor, who had just been tapped by Richard Nixon to become the vice president, he was tapped by Nixon because Nixon watched him give a speech to leaders in the black community uh, after the Cambridge riot um, in 1967, where he took a really, really hard line with African-American activists. And Nixon, who was running for president at the time, liked that sort of harsh paternalism, the Spiro T. Agnew uh, it was broadcast. It was, it was a televised uh, event. And so Nixon picked him for that very reason. Now, Agnew helped to spearhead the response to the riots and the uprisings in 1968, where on a single day, something like 3,000, I believe is 3,500 black citizens of Baltimore were arrested and charged individually with felonies, massively curtailing the ability of the citizens to, to, to vote. It, he, he ensured that everyone who was arrested was tried and many of them convicted of felony. So this was the original architecture of what would have been what would become mass incarceration and the war on crime that Agnew helped to spearhead in the Nixon administration. So we're talking about being in the hotbed of the, these two issues right here in Baltimore City as, as Baltimore County is ballooning. A, a very similar struggle, the, the sort of early um, architecture of mass incarceration is occurring at the same time. Now, we don't get here by accident, and I want to. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time because I want to. I want to get specifically to what these uh, issues look like now. Uh, as we moved in, into the decade of the 1960s, multiple uh, organizations were were mobilizing to expand education, to democratize education, um, on several fronts. Dr. King. Uh, the year that, that he was assassinated was working on his Poor People's Campaign with an emphasis on expanding access to quality education to people experiencing poverty. After his death, the Black Panther Party established freedom schools in multiple cities across the country. Um, now, the FBI was working incredibly hard to ensure that these uh, organizations did not survive. Um, I highly re really recommend if you're interested in reading any more of this, uh, We Are an African People. This is a book by the, the Cornell professor, Russell Rickford, uh, who documents extensively the history of black liberation schools, independent education and black power based education that was at every turn curtailed by the federal government, by the FBI. You can if you read COINTELPRO, you can see that even here in Baltimore, the uh, FBI agents were staking out Panther schools. They were convinced that what was happening on the inside was uh, illegal fundraising for guns. Um, when they actually were, were surveilling the schools, they, they seemed frustrated to find out that not only were people being fed, young people were being fed, but people were being taught. Uh, and, and these were very, very successful programs. Uh, and it was part of the fact that they were succeeding that was such a threat to the established order. And it, we have to really think about why education, in particular education to Black Americans, education to, to people experiencing poverty, people of color, is such a threat to the established order. Because what it demands is that the order change. I was hoping to show a, a short video clip from a speech James Baldwin gave uh, at Berkeley. I can drop that into the chat where he essentially says that when you are coming up against the establishment in terms of education, you're coming up against a multi-billion dollar machine, a machine that runs and is designed to recreate the, the system as it stands. It is built to replicate the status quo. Okay, so uh, I, another uh, really solid example of uh, 
the growth of these schools into the 1970s and the 1980s is Amiri Baraka's Repertory Theater, theater School. He did a lot of work in Newark, New Jersey in the Black Arts Movement to make Black-run schools, create Black curriculums, teach Black empowerment. And again, they met with uh, nothing but op uh, opposition from the federal government. Now, as we move into the school reform movement of the 1980s and 90s, one of the key things here is that the federal government is beginning to nationalize standards. Uh, if you know Daniel Patrick Moynihan and you know that the work that he was doing essentially to, uh, to, to treat issues of inner city America life as a, as a character failing, what he was attempting to do was bring the systems of power back into the hands of the federal government so that the federal government could take on a paternalistic view and then have, in a sense, more power to um, set the agenda for what is going to be taught in schools and how schools are going to be funded. Now, I want to fast, I'm skipping obviously a lot because this is this is a, a topic that, that we could spend multiple hours on here. Um, so, so where are we now? With No Child Left Behind in the early 2000s, this was a, a fait accompli for the school reform movements that were incredibly well funded. The, the, the writer Diane Ravitch talks specifically about how that legislation created a system where the standards could be essentially uh, nationalized across every school district, school district, which uh, made it so essentially the, the real winners in No Child Left Behind um, and the reforms to follow were corporations that were selling education tools to districts um, with one set of national standards. Ultimately, with the development of the Common Core, there could be one or two companies that, that are selling a test to the schools. So no longer did, did companies have to compete in every individual district with separate sets of standards. They can now scale their product across a common market. And this is what we've seen. We see co companies like Pearson basically take over education, charging districts millions and millions of dollars to be able to test and assess their children. At the same time, uh, when it came uh, to teaching and uh, training teachers, the behaviorist model of instruction took over. Now, this is a model that was popular in the Victorian era. It's lampooned in, in uh, Charles Dickens' great novel, H Hard Times, if you've ever read the very beginning of it. This notion that if you just have the right amount of inputs and you start tinkering with the inputs, you can control students' behaviors. And if you can control their behaviors, then you can control what they learn. Now, the problem with this, of course, and, and what you see on the screen here is the book Teach Like a Champion by uh, a Harvard uh, MBA student. I think he may have taught at some point in his life, but he, he was a, this is part of his Harvard MBA uh, project. It, it was a, it's a money, money making proposal here to write these books. And those of you who are familiar with this book, these books know that uh, essentially what he's doing, this is a textbook for training teachers, new teachers all over the country read his book like a textbook, and it has nothing to do with the content that you might instruct children with. It has everything to do with how to alter the behavior of children by manipulating them using, you know, groupthink, psychological techniques. Uh, and this is certainly the case of my teacher training, and I know several of the teachers that, that this is, this is, what, is what is sort of pounded into us, that you, are, you can only be a good teacher if you can control your class. So teachers are punished for not having control. Authority is always punitive. Um, and what that creates is a system where teachers quite often, especially if you start talking about TFA teachers who are, who, who are recruited from PWIs and uh, bring that sort of uh, power dynamic into the classroom and then are then reinscribing it using uh, essentially conditioning in, this, in such a way to, that alienates students from the process of learning. No longer are they learning because they love learning or they want to learn or they see some inherent value in learning. Their curiosity becomes unimportant. What's important is how well the teacher has managed them. Um, and this is an incredibly problematic mindset, but it's going on in classrooms all across the city. I wanna pause and sort of uh, tell you a very short story. Um, and it, this happened two years ago. Um, 
a parent of, uh, of one of my students came to speak to me at the school and, and she, she was a little bit embarrassed because her student had had some attendance issues and uh, she had not been up to the school, even though I'd sent a couple of emails and called her a couple of times. She, she, she was apologetic for not coming up to the school. And she said to me, she said, I'm really, really sorry. It's hard for me to enter a school building. See, my time in school wasn't very good myself. She said, when I was a child, and, and a content warning for, uh, I'm gonna, gonna mention sexual assault for a second, but uh, when she was a child in school, she, had, she was a, a survivor of sexual assault. And she had gone through that trauma. And then while going through that trauma at home, she came into the school building and she was confronted with nothing but belligerence and policing. People would yell at her to go to class that she wasn't wearing the right clothes, she was out of uniform. Constantly, she was confronted with triggering situations that would re-inscribe her trauma, and she felt like nowhere was safe. The place that she was supposed to be safe actually triggered her. And so it was hard for her, even as a parent, to come back into the building to, to do what she really wanted to do, create the situation where her daughter could succeed. And I want us thinking, because it's a very common refrain to complain about parents when we're thinking about uh, education, but so many of the parents who have been through the system that I'm describing have also been traumatized by the system. And the difficulty parents often have with engaging with the school is linked to the trauma that they experience in the system themselves. And, and this is an important thing to remember. Um, okay, so when you take a system of uh, authority-based conditioning that is the dominant mode in so many of the classrooms across the city, and you lay on top of that standardized testing, we have a, a, a situation that creates widespread apathy. It divorces young people from the thing that they're most hungry for, information about their world. Um, it destroys their curiosity. And at some point, and the difficult thing that I, educators often debate among themselves is how much of this is a nefarious and conscious plan by someone up on high, is it a conspiracy, or is it something that's just evolved and happened? Because the effect is the exact same thing as the, the white terrorists and vigilantes who attached 100 oxen to the front of Alexander Crummel's school. In, in some ways, it's more effective. You see, because it didn't stop Alexander Crummel, when he saw them do that, that propelled him in, uh, into a career in academics because he understood that if someone would go so far as to attach 100 oxen to a school, then there must be some, something to be desired in that building. But we've built a system now that actually alienates young people from the very thing that they want. And it's in my experience as an educator that every student wants it. They want to know about the world that they live in. They want to know about the world that they're often blamed for messing up, for being the problem in. They wanna to try to understand it. Uh, so I'm an English teacher. One of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is independent reading and self-selected uh, independent reading text. One of the, I find that almost all my students begin to hate reading somewhere around the sixth grade. So I have so few students, although this is changing, uh, coming to my classes, and identifying uh, automatically as someone who loves to read. But at some point in their life, they did love to read. And usually the point at which they, they stop loving to read is the point at which they become aware of the scores that they are making on standardized tests. You see, we have what's called a deficit framework. This deficit framework says that there is something wrong with students. The language we use around it, we call it an achievement gap, as if the students are missing something. And they hear this constantly. It's a refrain that's repeated over and over to young people that there is something that they're missing. And they're shown scores, they're shown data, they're, they're, they're told that they're in need of remediation, that they're behind. And the, and the weird thing that happens when you repeatedly tell someone this is that they are forced to identify with it. They begin to think that there's something that is wrong with them, even if they don't say it out loud. See, this was already proved uh, by Kenneth and Mamie Clark back 
1954 with the Dahl experiment, it was one of the crucial pieces of evidence that allowed the Supreme Court justices to rule in favor of Brown and Brown versus the Board of Education. And yet we know this and we keep doing it. The study after study has, has shown that parental income level is the single most prominent predictor of student scores on standardized tests. It has a 75 to 80% accuracy. The amount of money in a parent's bank account is the primary predictor of the score a student will make on a test. We know that, and yet each year we increase the number of standardized tests, we don't decrease it. In addition, students respond, uh, their stress levels elevate significantly uh, during standardized testing situations. Uh, studies that have gone on to show that students from the most disadvantaged neighborhoods with the highest rate of poverty and crime saw the largest changes in cortisol in advance, the cortisol, uh, the stress, a hormone that's used to moderate the, uh, to, uh, or, or process stress uh, levels. So again, we know this and yet we keep doing it. And I know that I'm, I'm running to the, to the end of my time. So I kind of want to talk specifically ab about how this, how this works. Um, so many of the scenarios that our students face, if you think about a student in Baltimore City who uh, did not pass their, their, uh, their district mandated, their state mandated uh, graduation requirement test like the park. Usually that student continues to take that test multiple times until they pass it. So if you take a student who did not pass their park state, they found that they were behind grade, they're gonna take their standardized test sometimes upwards of three times a year in both English and math. So if you're taking a standardized test three times in a year, this is a three day test, both the English and the math one, 90 minutes each section, if you continue to not pass it, you're taking six individual tests, but there's also uh, tests put on top of that, like iReady or Achieve 3000 that are other assessments that students are doing that companies have, have promised that if they take these tests, then they can, uh, they'll stand a better chance of doing well on these tests. If you add those in, they take that three times a year. So we're talking about six and three, they're taking nine standardized tests, but they gotta do it for math too. So we're already at 12 standardized tests in a year. Um, we've now added, in addition, Pearson has, has kindly made us a uh, benchmark test. They get taken at the mid unit and the end of unit. So we are now doing park style assessment. There's basically one section of a park test twice in every quarter. So we're talking about skyrocketing levels of data collection. So if you're a teacher in this situation, what you find is that you're collecting so much data, you do not have time to address any of it because it's time for another measurement. You can't do any teaching in between because all you're doing is measuring. And if the measurement is reading the same thing every time, then maybe you should stop measuring for a minute. And I worry personally as an educator that we're doing the kind of measurement that is reflecting what we want to measure rather than what actually needs to be measured, what children know. Um, here's this funny thing about cortisol, and this is mentioned in that study that I talked about. At some point, your brain can't handle processing, processing too much stress hormones, and it literally shuts itself down. And I've seen this so many times over and over and over again, where students who come from neighborhoods where they see and experience high levels of drug use or violence, high levels of stress, uh, maybe they've even come from, uh, maybe their brain itself uh, has been influenced by prenatal stress hormones, and so they've been coping with it their whole lives, but they've had to deal with uh, 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 lead paint poisonings uh, and all these other environmental factors are put in situations where their t their cortisol level is triggered and elevated. It's almost like it's a it's the, the system is designed to blow when we overwhelm it, and we've built it so that we're constantly overwhelming it. Again, this is the thing that seems almost as if it's designed this way, because there is another way to educate and. And we gotta think about how we can break the system. I think the, the most important things, and obviously this is not the end all be all, and I've barely even scratched the surface on all this, uh, but reparations are, are crucial and key. And building a space for young people to rise in their power by nurturing their curiosity and fostering their joy. Classrooms have to be a space filled with joy. The one thing that I do that I think is really important, this week has been an amazing week back. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we worry and wring our hands so often about what the students have lost. But I can tell you after a, a week 
with my sophomores and my juniors, I don't think they lost nearly what we think they lost. I think uh, so many of the young people have returned from this pandemic wiser than their elders, more thoughtful for, than their elders, demanding action on the things that they had seen. They, I think it, they were... So my uh, computer just kicked me off Zoom. So I'm really at the end here. Um, I, as I try and sign back in, I'll go ahead and, and sign off. And if there's any questions that I didn't a answer in the chat, I'm sorry. It's because I couldn't see them. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. That was an amazing presentation. I learned so much. And really the question I'm left thinking about is how can society, how can people expect schools to be the great equalizer when they're operating in very inequitable conditions. That's it for our DEI presentation this week. Thanks everyone. Back to you, Anne. That was incredible. And I am pretty sure Dan had maybe 45 minutes to pull that together. Thanks for Riha. Found out she didn't have power at 4.30. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Dan, for sharing that. And I, I wish, to, I'm going to save the comments for you in the chat. When you rejoin, you won't be able to see them. So I'm going to save them and send them to you because people are clearly very impacted and are having all sorts of light bulbs going off based on, on the presentation that you gave. So thank you. I'm actually going to give it over now um, to Tisha. Tisha, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, wow, what a presentation. Fariha, you picked a great backup um, for today. Dan is amazing. And I just want to remind everyone he's in the Youth Programs Committee. Thank you very much. Um, and it was just very educational and uh, something I think that we all learned something from this. Um, so great job for Riha for bringing Dan in to back you up and he represented you well. And great job, Dan, on an amazing presentation. It is now time for us to do a little work uh, and to begin working together in our work groups and our committees on our action planning. Um, I reviewed the framework um, for creating those action plans a few weeks ago. Uh, and so we're going to get ready to go into our committees, but we thought it might be helpful to do just a very quick refresher uh, for anybody who may have missed the presentation. I think my internet was really crazy the last time we were together. So I'm told I was going in and out a little bit. So this is a, a really, really good time for us to just refresh our memories um, before we go into our committees. Anne, are you ready to help me out with that? Thank you very much. All right, so we are ready to go into action planning. Um, we have already created action statements for each committee. Give yourselves a pat on, the, pat on the back for that. Now we are going to create our SMART goals and recommended projects to support our action statements. We launched those conversations the last time we, we were together. So what is it that we are being expected to do? We want each task force committee to develop up to five SMART goals that will drive implementation of your action statement. Once the goals are established, the committee will create supporting recommended, recommended projects that will achieve the stated goal. So someone um, asked a question, well, do you have to do the SMART goals first, and then do you come back and actually do the projects? Not necessarily. You can do a goal and then do your projects and do your next goal and do the projects. So you can do all your goals and then come back and do the projects. That's completely up to you. But at the end of the day, we don't want you to have more than five SMART goals per committee. Okay, next slide, Ann. So I gave an example. This is the youth programs. Uh, just an example we haven't finalized, but I lay out our action statement, which everyone has already seen 
and has been vetted by the task force. Now that we have an agreed upon action statement, we needed to create a goal to support that action statement. So our goal, goal one, is to increase safe spaces where children and youth can explore their interests and develop a healthy curiosity for their future possibilities. That's our goal. So under that, we have our strategies and or projects that we would use to achieve goal one. Goal one is aligned to our action statement. After each goal, we want to have three to five recommended projects or strategies. And so our two projects or strategies under goal one is, for example, increasing funding for recreation centers to include 21st century facility design, expanded innovative program offerings, and community-based partnerships that assist with increased participation across genders, age groups, et cetera. And then our second potential project is to engage youth in the placemaking process of parks and other public spaces so that young people can contribute to the community and develop a strong sense of ownership and connection to the city's public spaces. Now, what's really important here that I want us to take away is we want these goals and strategies and projects to be places for everyone to get involved. This shouldn't be a laundry list of things where you're telling the city what it should do. Well, you know, the mayor's office and children and family success should do this. Uh, Rec and Park should do that. Department of Transportation should do this. We want to be in it. Absolutely, you want city government to be a key partner in everything that we do. So, of course, some of our strategies are dependent on city government engagement, city government action. But we also wanna be actors in these plans. That's why we're here because we are in a position of passion and our passion and our commitment empowers us, enables us, obligates us to take action. So when you're thinking about your goals and you're thinking about your projects and your strategies, Try to be as broad in terms of bringing people to this opportunity to make Baltimore better. Think about government, think about your organizations, think about the state, think about neighborhoods, you, you know, just be as inclusive as possible around how we do this together. This is not telling other people what to do. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to bring everyone to helping to make Baltimore a trauma-informed care city that um, is working towards healing, healing and building resiliency, right? So I just wanna really make sure that people are clear that we want the goals and the actions and strategies to be about bringing the all of our assets and government is absolutely an asset, but government cannot do this alone. Gover we need community. We need the faith-based community. We need higher ed. We need young people. We need older people. We need everyone to have a place in this work. So I just wanna make sure that's very clear. Um, next slide, Anne. And here was just another example that we went over for the decolonizing um, committee. I think their name has changed a little bit. They've kind of refreshed their plan since the last time we were together. But this is another example where we have an action statement, we have a goal, and then we have a strategy. And in this particular case, the ones on the youth slide, they were very government centric. They were funding for rec and parks and placemaking work. Here, this committee is saying, they want to develop a toolkit. And based on how this is written, they are going to harness the resources of that committee to develop this toolkit that focuses on all of these issues around structural racism with the goal of educating people around how to decolonize Baltimore City and, and from a policy 
uh, perspective. And so in this example, this is not about government doing something. This is about this particular committee raising their hand and saying the committee will develop a toolkit. So I really loved this example because the committee is taking ownership very specifically of a key strategy in driving their action statement. So in, in closing, I just wanna remind people the way my brain works around this is that the action statement is the what. What are we going to do? What is our commitment to our city? And the goals and the strategies is the how. Now that I've told you what I'm gonna do, the next thing I'm gonna tell you is how I'm gonna do it. That's what I'm thinking, what and how. So that's kind of the big picture overview. I think we have a few weeks to work on this till late September. Uh, it, when are we, what's our timeline? And I'm sorry, I was about to say late September, but late September is like next week. Right, I think it's mid-October is what we said. Mid-October, yes, yes, not late September. So, so we do have to get busy. Um, and we'll do a check-in in mid-October to just see how we're doing and to provide each other feedback. But that gives you an overview um, so that we can go into our committees and get some work done. Was that helpful, you think, Anne? Okay, good. Thank you. So now you're going to push us into our groups, right? And are we to come back at 6.55, Anne, or do we go to our groups and then we break, and we break out after that? Yeah, I think we're breaking from our groups. I okay. think different committees I've seen work longer or wrap earlier. And so I think it works best to just allow for groups to break um, from where they are. I'm going to repost the agenda into the chat. Thank you. Because on the agenda are links for each subcommittee's working documents that you, some groups had really started working in and, and some groups weren't really working in. Hold on, my, my computer does not like to copy and paste from the chat itself. So give me two seconds. Let's try this here. Okay. So in there are linked for each subcommittee, your document. Um, as an FYI, the we try to highlight in this room rotating groups. And so the youth focused group will stay on this room. You'll be on the live stream and you'll be on the recording. So um, the prize, the prize. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open room so that folks can start, start working. We have about 20 minutes left, but you, when you're done, you can leave from your, your group. So thanks all. Thank you. Okay, so now that everybody's in their rooms, we can get started. Everybody feeling good? Okay. Good. Yeah, feeling good. All right. So do y'all remember um what our goal was last time? Like our homework? No. I want to take I, elder, so you're gonna have to tell no. me. It's all right. I'm gonna pass it to Dr. K real quick. Okay, great. Hi everybody, it's so nice to see you. Uh thank you very much, Elder. Last time that we met, um, Elder gave us a excellent charge that we were to review the action statement and come back with um, some ideas for goals and um, think about the SMART goal. And so um, here is our action statement that we have gone over before. Um, and so we want to come up with our SMART goals. And again, just a reminder, because visual reminder, specific, so something specific. So it can't be general, like we will improve things, right? So it has to be very specific about what we want to do and how are we going to measure it, which means that we should have some sort of a benchmark that we want to reach. And then is it attainable? So can we really do that within a time frame? And is it relevant with what we're trying to achieve through our long-term objectives and then a time base? 
So we want to be able to say, we're going to achieve this by a specific date. So Elder had charged uh, our group with looking at this action statement and thinking about one goal that we want to set um, to achieve the work that we uh, outlined here in the action statement. Um, I think that when we last met, we had uh, gone back to that rec center idea, um, and then we talked about some general improvements around youth environments. But what is the first goal that you all would like to set um, and we can workshop it a little bit um, to achieve the action statement. Did you wanna follow up on the rec center idea? Did you wanna come up with a different one? What were your thoughts? Elder, did you have a direction you'd like us to go well, as a young person? Well, since you mentioned the rec center idea, um, since nobody else said, I would like to uh, continue with that. Okay. All right. And so with this um, action statement, we specifically said, for Baltimore to heal, we must create spaces where youth can safely imagine and inhabit their futures. Um, and a place for young Baltimoreans to practice healthy self-determination. And so if we're looking at rec centers specifically, what is it that we want for rec centers? Do we want more of them to be open? Do we want the ones to be open to be healthy spaces? And what does that look like? What is our first thought as far as how rec centers can help meet this action? Um, I feel like Dr. K, what we should do is like just kind of, everybody like just get in the top of their head like what would be the ideal rec center um that would help solve some of the problems that we're having right now like if you could invent it or create it however that you wanted it to be specific to whatever issue that you're trying to solve whether it's trauma or coping skills or whichever thing that you're trying to address like how would that look ideally to you now for me I never really went to rec centers um, because only one that's close to my house is by Drew Hill. And I remember it wasn't really open for a while. And that's that was kind of far. Like my mom didn't really let me go that far. So I didn't really have a lot of experience with rec centers. So for me, this is kind of just like a clean slate. Like, you know, what would the perfect um, place or peaceful space look like? Um, I can go first if you want me to. Or I was like, I have I have suggestions if if that's all right. Say say again. I said, can you hear me? I have suggestions if that's all right. Yeah, please. So there's a book that I love. It's called um, it, it's by Dr. Bettina Love. I'm sure people have read it. It's about abolitionist teaching. And in that book, she talks about this idea of home place, and she also talks about. The, what like the local rec center slash boys and girls club was like for her. And so to me, like what that space looks like drawing off her Dr. Bettina um, Love's experience would one, that every community has one, right? Or maybe every school has one like next to it. I remember I went to Westside Elementary School number 24, which is since closed, but connected to it right on Fulton Avenue was a rec center. And what made it so awesome was that you were allowed to explore your interests. So the perfect rec center to me is one, we have to increase the number, but two, it truly allows young people to explore their interests, whether that's through field trips or having speakers come in and it's youth led. It's youth led. It allows youth to see other people who look like them or who are close in their age leading the activities. It has a peer mediation program. It also helps young people with things like career skills. It's like a one-stop shop but it's led by youth instead of adults. Um, and of course adults can mentor like people of the age of 25, but I think the most powerful thing is for young people to see those who are close to them leading the activities. I think that's really important. Definitely. Um, I think like just to incorporate, we should also just have like some sort of education that doesn't seem like education because I feel like it, I can't remember what I was watching, but I was watching this interview on The Breakfast Club, and basically he was saying people don't understand how 
the trauma from the past affects us physically now. And I feel like as far as, you know, when you go into a rec center, you're what? Like in middle school, you're in elementary, not too much in high school, but you still could be. Um, And then in those times, we experience conflict a lot. So if we could have some type of area or program where youth could focus on conflict resolution and just addressing actual things that are happening in them physically, then I feel like that would really help. All right. Please let me know if I'm not capturing what you guys are saying. Um, other people have a description of what an ideal rec center would look like. So I just want to add that I do think physical space matters and this, this notion, I think I lifted it up in my recommendation about 21st century, 21st century design is important. And the reason I say that is because the, the physical space that our young people inhabit is, is not uplifting to me. You know, a lot of our rec centers are dark. Uh, they're in a lot of disrepair. And so having them and them not being representative of joy and safety and light, the physical space matters. So I don't know how to communicate that. And it may not be 21st century design, but I think physical space matters. And if all we have is a bunch of buildings that the bathrooms are full of graffiti or that the lighting is dark or that there's water leaking in the ceilings, it, it's, it doesn't get us what we need. So it's about the programming and it's actually about the space. And I think we've seen how space matters in our, in our new schools plan. Um, and so I just wanna replicate that um, and build on that in, in our rec center uh, programming. The other thing I would say is I would like rec centers to be a place where you can go to for peace, meditation, self-reflection. A lot of times we are living in chaos and drama. And I think every person needs a safe place where they can go and breathe and get themselves together. And so I, I would like to see every rec center to have a safe place um, where you can actually disconnect from whatever your stresses are and um, recalibrate yourself, whether it is meditation, whether it is just being in silence, but something that a, a, a safe place where you can go. And if it's crazy around, you can be like, you know what, I'm going to this rec center and there's this room where I can find peace. So I would like to make that a standard resource for every young person. Excellent. And I'm again, glad. let me know if I didn't capture it. Go ahead, Elder. No, I'm really glad that you said that, Ms. Tisha. Um, you know, the physical is definitely very essential. And with that, I think we definitely should in include some local artists and just artwork. And But with artwork, just definitely having like portraits of people who made it out of Baltimore, people who are successful in Baltimore. I remember one time I went to Western and I saw this uh, portrait of Erica Bridgeford and I, and I was just so inspired because I'm like, dang, like she, she, she has her own portrait in a, a historical school. Like that's big. She came out of Baltimore. Like that's really big. And that inspired me. I said, well, if she could do it then I could do it. You know, I didn't go to Western, but one day my face going to be somewhere, you know, just having, having these, um, students and these young people see what success looks like because a lot of times you know all we see is you know drug dealers all we see is um you know people who are on drugs and just poverty everywhere it's kind of hard to imagine anything else unless it's on tv or you a famous basketball player or something like that but actually having murals of, and pictures of real people who did real things for themselves in order to get to where they need to be i feel like that would really really um have an impact Excellent. Um, other feedback, other things that would make an ideal rec center in your imagination? 
Um, I do think there's one more thing that we haven't touched on, which is like expanded job opportunities for the youth. I think the lack of employment is a huge issue. And if we can somehow connect that to the rec centers, it would be a huge success. Do you think that the job focus should be, I agree, kids working in rec centers and leading the programs. I, I, I totally agree with that. But do you want us to have a separate goal specifically related to, got, to jobs in a more broad way and then some strategies under that? Or do you want to keep the jobs piece in this one? That's just something to think about. And could it be in both? That as part of rec centers, there would be increased jobs, but there could be a whole goal specific to jobs. Absolutely. Overall. Yep, that's true. Does that work for everybody, sort of what it looks like now? And again, this is not final. So if at two o'clock in the morning you wake up and go, I know what else should be there, then you can always uh, call, text, or email and we can add it. Um, so with this list, um, would people be okay if we come up with our general goals and we can wordsmith later, but at least we get our general goals done and then we can come back with like drafts and things like that. Would that be okay with people? Yeah. Okay. So to that last point. Sorry, where, sorry Dr. Ahead. K. I know, I think Elijah Davis is trying to say something. He said, oh, I'm, he, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if you can come off mute. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I don't see me, so I'll, I just see, okay. Yeah, I wanted to add that um, I do a lot of work in the rec centers. Um, I did for, for a few years, I was the official photographer for Baltimore Recs and Parks. And um, I was doing a lot of PRP and mentoring and a lot of my clients were involved with programs in the rec center. and. Um, Specifically, Upton and on Pennsylvania Avenue and Shake and Bake, I work very closely with those centers. And what I've noticed, and, and I've been paying close attention to now that I've had certain experiences, is that we really need to focus. All these things are amazing. But the thing that probably is most important is who's working in these rec centers, like the training. A lot of these a lot of the staff are ill prepared to work with children that have suffered trauma. A lot of the staff are still working out their experiences with trauma. So what I've seen lately in quite a few of these rec centers and especially the ones, and I don't know how to put this without offending people, but it seems like some of the worst communities, they put some of the worst people there because one supervisor told me that this woman's approach was, how can, effective. And I say, so just because this neighborhood is, is probably a, just let's say a little rougher than most, you put someone here that is disrespectful, um, that, you know, is, is just just has really a nasty disposition and personality. And, and I don't think that these communities deserve this. I definitely don't think the children deserve it. So I think the, the biggest thing is training. If, if there's some kind of way we can create a mechanism to uh, even even the funding, the funding could go towards hiring more quality people because the, the buildings are falling apart. However, the people that are in them are much worse. I've seen this firsthand. I've taken kids from these centers because the, the staff, they curse. They, it's, it's just ridiculous. It's, uh, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe some of the things I've experienced since I've started really checking for it. So, so I, I think to your point, I think what we would just do when we talk about, because I think Elder asked the right question, which is what does an ideal rec center look like? So we've talked about space, we've talked about um, programming, and I think one of the strategies will be about training and support. 
um, just to make sure that we have high quality staff um, that are trained to do the job that we're asking them to do. I think this vision that we have is bigger than basketball games and, you know, playing sports. It's really about how, um, how Rec and Parks is an asset and how it connects with young people and enables young people to grow. So I think to your point, we just wanna make sure that we have one of our strategies in this area to be about training and support of a high quality staff um, in our rec centers. And we can do some more defining that. And I just wanna remind everyone that we also have a training committee within the task force. So I'm sure um, they're gonna also be talking about this same um, area of focus that you're lifting up that we just want high quality people working with our with our young people. So I think that's really, really great. Yeah. And I, I, I believe exactly um, some of the things you mentioned um, regarding the what the, the spaces should look like physically. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's very important because um, what I was explaining to a lot of the staff at these centers is that these young people, the rec center is kind of like an escape, an escape of the reality that's, you know, been their life for so long. So if they come there and they get what they get in these, in their environment, they really see no need to, to, to continue to go there. So that's how they end up back. Most of them on the streets, most of them in, into gangs because the place where they wanted peace or they wanted to consider maybe a, like a safe haven it's just become that environment that they've you know they've come to to know yeah i think we got that that's a great one i know we're short on time elder but we it, i think we make some good progress on um the recreational centers as an option who was it that lifted up jobs um as another important element who on the i'm sorry i can't no, who, Why I said something. who was that that was me brendan mcfadden hi brendan do you want us so we have it in the rec piece do you also want us to think about jobs as a second goal we won't go into detail tonight but i was just wondering what are your thoughts about that i definitely think that should be a goal of ours i think that's a, a big opportunity that we could take advantage of okay so in the end, and young elder, I'll re defer to you, but I'm always respectful of everybody's time. And I know you're in classes and you know, we want you to hit all A's this semester. Um, so we're, we're about one minute away from seven o'clock. We made a lot of progress on Rec and Parks. Um, elder, are you comfortable with us having jobs teed up as the strategy, um, the goal that we'll work on for next, time we're together. Does that work for you? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a perfect segue. Okay. Anybody else have anything else that they want to add in the last minute? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, that means we are all in agreement and we're going to end on time at 7 p.m. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. K. You're always a great facilitator. And thank you, Elder, for leading the way. So when we come back next week, we not next week, at our next meeting, Dr. K, you all will have had an opportunity to play with goal number one. Yep. So we have like a, a, a draft for people to look at. And then we'll kick off the work session on goal number two, which we're going to focus on youth jobs. All right, thank okay. you so much. All right, cool everybody, thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.